In 1871, for a few months during the summer, there was something unusual going on in Paris. A completely functional democratic commune was formed by the working people and they brought reforms that would still be considered revolutionary today. Anarchists, Marxists and other socialists worked together on this project, which was supposed to be the beginning of a worldwide workers' revolution. But let's take a step back and see how we got there. As I am sure you are well aware, during the mid 18th century, the industrial revolution happened, which led to people who used to be farmers to be unemployed, since new farming equipment meant that farming requires less work and the uh, introduction of private property centralized all farmland in the hands of the wealthy elites. Those new unemployed farmers went to the cities to work in the new industrialized factories. One of those cities was Paris and it had huge amounts of factories that needed workers. Of course, since it was before unions or labor rights, the workers had to work for 12, sometimes 18 hours a day without weekends or vacations to look forward to. For some reason, those people weren't happy and there were multiple riots and demonstrations throughout the century. The French government at the time was the second French empire ruled by Napoleon. N no, not that one, his nephew, Napoleon III. He tried to emulate his uncle in every way he could, but he never managed it and the fact that they were back to an emperor didn't quite please the people either. The climate in Paris was revolutionary. The high number of alienated workers cramped in small places and the availability of new socialist and anarchist literature gave Paris the potential for revolution. But while Napoleon III and his government were going about the usual business of suppressing workers, making themselves richer and granting themselves privileges, across the border there was someone provoking them. The Prussians, under uh, the leadership of Bismarck, wanted a confrontation to get Elsass and Lorraine and to unify the smaller German states into a single German empire. The Germans sent a letter, which the French didn't like, so a week later Napoleon had declared that he would invade them. A wave of nationalism swept across France. The workers and revolutionaries of Paris focused on banding together with the bourgeoisie against the Prussians and forgot about the class struggle and stuff like that. They were going to destroy the Prussians and rule Europe just like they did under Napoleon I. And then the French army got itself surrounded and the emperor was captured by the Germans. Upon losing their head of government, the rest of the French leadership decided that this was as good a time as ever to proclaim the Second French Republic, which immediately got destroyed and then they proclaimed the Third French Republic and the Prussians promptly surrounded the capital city of Paris and asked for Elsass and Lorraine plus a lot of money in exchange for peace. The government declared that they would not give up an inch of territory to the Prussian invader. The Prussians dug trenches around Paris and decided to wait until the French would give up. Weeks turned into months and nothing much happened besides the fact that the food and coal supply in the city got lower. At the time there were 50,000 professional soldiers and 120,000 recruits who were loyal to the government in Paris and around 300,000 men from the National Guard. After some more starving and suffering, there was a proposal for an armistice with the Germans. The condition was that the French army had to give up their arms. The National Guard was exempt from this because the government argued that they needed them to keep order in the city. Now, the National Guard was mostly made up of civilians and they were organized by the districts they were from. They mostly reflected the opinions of the workers of Paris and the surrounding provinces, which was inspired by socialist and anarchist writing. They weren't exactly disciplined and even demanded to elect their own officers and sometimes refused to follow orders unless they had democratically decided if they were okay with the order. Can you imagine that? Democracy in the army. After the climate became more heated and the government and the National Guard fought about the few guns, the government left the city. This means that the workers were now somehow in control of the city. The national government as well as the local government including the mayor had left. Suddenly everything the workers dreamed of could be achieved. They could create a new government based on the socialist and anarchist ideas they had read about. All that change was suddenly possible. They created a council to govern the commune and immediately held elections. The council was made up of representatives that represented about 20,000 citizens each. They could immediately called back by the voters if they backed something the people didn't agree with. The council also had some professions represented in it, for example, they had 33 industrial workers, 5 small business owners, 19 clerks and other big professions taking part in the voting in the meeting. This was to ensure that the laws they made wouldn't hurt the workers of Paris. They officially proclaimed the commune, they held a big parade and started to implement their changes. They changed the flag to a plain red banner and switched the calendar back to the disastrous thing they tried during the French Revolution a few decades earlier. The council was made up of different factions. There were the radicals that wanted to implement changes that would help the people and there were the moderates that didn't want to do that and argued that a better world isn't possible. 
this will be familiar to anyone who has ever seen any political debate. The radicals were made up of both anarchists and socialists who were happy to work together at this time. Because the anarchists uh, proposed it, they decided to not have a president, mayor or commander in chief. You know, anarchism, rule without a leader. Those jobs were to be done by democratically elected committees instead. Oh, and when I mean democratically elected, I mean every man over 20. In the six times they met, they agreed on some nice changes, for example. The abolition of capital punishment, the abolition of military conscription, the separation of church and state, the remission of rents owed for the entire period of the siege, the abolition of child labor and night work in bakeries, the granting of pensions to the unmarried companions of children of National Guardsmen who gave their life in active service. This was new since until then only married people got the pensions. The free return by pawn shops of all workmen's tools and household items valued up to 20 francs pledged during the siege. The postponement of commercial debt obligations and the abolition of interest on debts. The right of the workers to take over and run an enterprise if it were deserted by its owner. The prohibition of fines imposed by employers on the workmen. In addition to that, they seized church land and made it public. Churches could still continue to say and do religious stuff if they allowed political debates in churches in the evening. They then tore down the Vendome column, which was built to commemorate Napoleon's conquests and melted it down to create coins. They also tried to take Versailles with military force, but that failed spectacularly. They then decided not to conquer the rest of France, but to show them that a better way is possible. To lead by example and demonstrate the superiority of their ideals. And that's why they made their biggest mistake. They let the Bank of France operate as usual. This means that the government, which had fled Paris, had both time and money to recruit an army. The other French provinces didn't want to follow the example of the Commune either. This was because most of rural France was incredibly conservative compared to the revolutionaries in Paris. After about three months, the army outside the city gates was ready to take Paris back by force. The following week was known as the Bloody Week. This is of course because the Emperor peacefully convinced the people of Paris to give up their new freedoms and they agreed and everything went over peacefully. No just kidding, they murdered everyone and burned down half of Paris. Afterward, socialists and anarchists split because they disagreed on what the commune should have done differently. Anarchists argued that they should have spread the ideas of the commune more and socialists argued that they should have been more militarist to defend themselves. This split is there until today. So in conclusion, even though it ended quickly, the commune taught us many lessons about how to establish a democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and to be careful not to let outside powers become too powerful. And 41 years later, a Russian revolutionary and his successor would make sure that their revolution would not be crushed by foreign powers. But that's a story for another time.